Today, presented by Roger Castells Graes. The title is Viruses in Motion, a close look at virus maturation through cryo-electron microscopy. Roger is from the John Inns Center in the United Kingdom. Are you ready to put up your slides, Roger? Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank, thank you very much. Okay, so uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, viruses, uh, maturation, and cryo EM. Okay, I will put the laser point. Okay, so viruses are amazing. Uh, they can have lots of different shapes and sizes, and they can be like small, they can be big, and even though they look quite rigid, some of them can be very dynamic. I like to think about viruses as cookie boxes. Why cookie boxes? Well, because they have the protein code, which would be the cookie box, and then they have the genetic material, which would be the cookies. But these cookies is what I say that they are bad cookies, because it's what allows them to make copies of themselves and infect us. As a kid, I like to paint cookie boxes. My grandmother uses them to keep the sewing stuff, and some people use them to keep letters. And as I say, the viruses, they have this bad cookie. But some scientists, we are only interested in the cookie box. So when we only use the cookie box, is what we call a virus-like particle, a VLP. These virus-like particles, we can decorate them with uh, fluorescent proteins for bioimaging applications. We can load them with drugs for drug delivery. And we can also load them with information for gene therapy, for example. And we can also look at their structure with technologies like cryo-electron microscopy to understand the mechanisms of viruses. And in today's talk, I'm going to focus on this aspect. So we are using cryoEM to study maturation. So what is virus maturation? Virus maturation is a transition from an initial assembly uh, from a particle to a final one. And basically what happens is that lots of viruses, like it's common in animal virus and bacteriophages, they have an initial stage and then a final one. But what happens is that in this process, sometimes it's very difficult to seal different steps. So for a long time, what was wanted was a system where you could study the whole maturation process in vitro. And to put it in other words, it's like if you have, for example, the metamorphosis of a bee, and we can call it the maturation of a bee, and you can see here the life cycle of the bee. So here would be the life cycle of the virus, the procapsids, the intermediates in the maturation, and the capsid. So what happens a lot of times is that we cannot see some of these intermediates. And it's like if you cannot see what happens in between, between the egg and the bee. So with this project, what we wanted to do was to have the full picture of the whole maturation process. Uh, to do this, we have used a virus from a moth from South Africa called Pine Emperor moth. The larvae of this moth can be infected with a virus called Norelia capensis omega virus, also known as N omega B. Uh, N omega B, very briefly, is a virus uh, which has single positive sense of RNA. Uh, it's icosahedral and has 240 copies of one kind of code protein that you can see here. During the maturation, this code protein undergoes an autofertility cleavage, which generates a small peptide which is a lytic peptide. And this lytic peptide is like a drilling machine that allows the virus to then make holes into the membranes. So uh, this virus is very cool because you can control the maturation with the pH. So initially you can have a neutral pH at around 7.6. You can drop the pH and the virus will start compacting. And then you can go down to around 5.5 and here it will start the cleavage process. And when then you reach like finally a five, you will get the, the final stage. So you can go from neutral to expanded and then it will compact until the final one at a uh, CD pH. And it's like if you have like a Hoverman sphere where you can just basically control the size of the virus by changing the pH. So the goal of this project was to make a movie of the whole maturation. And to do this, uh, we have used, uh, well, expression of virus-like particles in plants and insect cells, purified them, and then uh, we put them in different conditions. And the idea was to then do the cryo structure of each one of the structures 
and then put together all these structures and be like the frames of a movie. Very briefly, how we produce particles. Uh, as an example, for example, in plants, you could take the gene for the whole protein, you could put it into bacteria, bacteria will transfer the information into plants, plant will produce your particle, well, if you are lucky, and then you will purify the particles. And if we have a look at the plant cell, this is just a control. Here you can see the cell wall, the cytoplasm, here the ribosomes. And if we have a plant expressing our particles, here you can see how they accumulate in thousands in the cytoplasm. So then what we would do is to take a, a blender. And we will then purify the particles. And after months of work, you may end up getting samples like this, where you wow. have like all your like uh, nice particles. So in today's talk, I'm going to focus on the cryo-M aspect. So for cryo-M, uh, we have uh, collaborated with the University of Leeds, where they have an amazing team and amazing microscopes. And basically, we bring the particles and we freeze them. And you can see here the particles in ice. Then uh, I can put them. And you can do uh, uh, classifications. And you can see that it's very homogeneous for this one and do 3D reconstructions. And now I'm going to show you the structure for the capsid. And uh, we got it to 2.7 Armstrongs. And you can see that uh, it, in great detail all the features from both the outside and also like the inside of the particle. And we can see things like, for example, the, the beta sheets and also the, the alpha helices. And then we can also even go to the cleavage site. And here you can see in the place where there is the break in the density after there has been this autopotilactic cleavage that I was mentioning. So uh, how do we then select all the different pHs to use for the different intermediates? So we collaborated with Stomo Matsui from Stanford, and he did a sax analysis. So we tested a range of pHs, and this is the final one that we use. So basically, in this plot, uh, this is the scattering from the sax, and you can see in the this, the blue would be the procapsid. And then as you move to the right, there is a reduction in size, which, as you can see, it goes also in reduction in pH. So then we selected these pHs. And well, and to show you an example of what happens when you reduce the pH, for example, from pH 7.6 to pH 5, which would be the extremes, you can see like a drastic change in size and conformation. These ones are more uh, compact. So now, the final movie. So this movie uh, took uh, lots of particles and images and structures. So by the end of this movie, uh, what we will look is at the different structures and how we have morphed them. Uh, and here, it's a summary of some of these structures. So we would go from the procapsid to the capsid, and you can see how there is a reduction in size as you uh, mature. So to compare them, uh, I will show you the fitted models into the cryo maps. So this is the procapsid, for example. Each different color is one subunit, and subunits, they go in tetramers, so in groups of four. Uh, so this is why there are four different colors. So this is procapsid, then this is one intermediate, and then, for example, this is the capsid. So you can see that, that there is like a huge change in conformation. And if we look through a section, so we have again the procapsid, and you can see that it has kind of pores here. So when we go through the maturation, you can see how they close. And at the end, you get a very compact particle, which would be very resistant to the, to the environment. So if we look then to, for example, the subunits of the virus, uh, as I said, it's made of the syncope protein. So as you can see here in the procapsid, all the different subunits have the same conformation. But when the particle matures, uh, the different uh, subunits, they specialize. And in the helical part, they uh, adopt different conformations, which are related with their final function, if it's more like, like lytic or like structural. So it's very interesting because the same protein, it depends on where its position in the particle, is able to reach a different folding, which is super cool. And then if we look, for example, at the cleavage site, here we can see the procapsid. And here, uh, this is the place where the cleavage will occur. And here you can see some of the amino acids that participate. And if we then look at the capsid, you see how there has been the conformational change. There has been the cleavage triggered, and here the lytic peptide has been released. And if we do a morphing of the models, you can see how here, click. Uh, 
click how there is the this shift that then will trigger the, the cleavage. So uh, now uh, to conclude, I will show you the the, the movie. Well, this is a, <laughs> like uh, from the different morphings that we have for the maps and the structures we have at the moment. So here for you the the movie of n omega v maturation. So uh, what we see first is the the procapsid and now you will see how it starts compacting and it goes through the intermediates you will see for example here in this pore how it is starting to compact and until it reaches the conformation of the capsid and now you will see like an expansion so how it goes from a different view from the fivefold how the different subunits are uh, rearranging and how it's reaching the the, the procapsid stage again and we can have a look at the inside from the particle and here you can see some of the movements and rearrangements from this helical part that I was mentioning before. And this is another view and here you can see one of the pores, how when it moves towards the capsid stage, it then uh, compacts. And now we will see how it expands again and it opens. So it's quite cool to be able to see each subunit, how it's behaving and how it's reorganizing. So to summarize, uh, we can show that uh, with these maps and structures, we can see details like, for example, how the cleavage is occurring. Then we can have a look at the different subunits and how each one is uh, changing during the maturation process. And we can have a look at the overall of the structure and see how the particle goes from the initial procapsid to the intermediate to the final infectious capsid. So uh, that's all. Uh, I want to thank, uh, well, the, the, the sponsors and the people who gave me the, the fellowship. I want to thank uh, George and all my supervisory team and collaborators, all the people that have helped me <laughs> during the, the, this, this journey and the uh, symposium organizers for this great symposium and all of you for your attention. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Roger, for the premiere. <laughs> Indeed, the movie was very cool. So I see that there is a question from Andreas from the audience, and he's asking, why did you choose the, this virus for your maturation studies? Yeah, so this is a very good question. Uh, so we choose this one in particular because uh, we can control all the different stages of the maturation in vitro and by changing the pH, which was which is like a, a key fact because lots of them, the some of the intermediates are too unst unstable. So it's very difficult and you will need to look them inside the cell. But in this case, we can purify them and get through all the different steps just by changing the pH. And it's quite unique for this virus, this process. Okay, so I had another question. So in vivo, where is this maturation taking place? Does it take yeah. place outside? The, the yeah. Or... Yes, so yeah, that's also a very good question. So it's quite curious. So the, the idea that there is now about this virus is basically what happens is that the larvae uh, eats the particles, they populate the, 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 the cells in the gut, and then they, they grow there. And basically what happens is that the idea is that there is apoptosis of the cells and then there is a drop in pH. And if you look at the feces and vomit of the, of the infected larvae, they are very acid. So it looks like this is the process that then triggers the maturation. And what is interesting is that then the particles will be eaten by other larvae around the plant. And when the particle goes inside the gut, the gut is very basic, like 10, 12 pH. And then this is what releases the lytic peptides. Because we have done some experiments with liposomes. And if you put the particles with acidic liposomes, they cannot break them. You need like a basic pH to release the lytic peptide and then make the hole. So it looks like the whole cycle is quite linked with the changes in pH in the larvae from this moth. Okay. Uh, and there is another question from Albert Bosque. Great talk and enormous task. I, I think this is uh, oh, an sorry. old question. Yeah. It's an old question indeed. Okay. Okay, so thank you, Roger. Yeah, thank you. 
And now we will move to the next talk. The next talk is going to be presented by Maria Arista Romero from the Institute of Bioengineering of Catalonia and IDEC. And the title of her talk is the uh, Nanostructural Characterization of Influenza Virus-like Particles with Super Resolution Microscopy. First of all, thank you so much for letting me present here today. I'm not, I don't have a lot of chances to present my work to virologists, so I'm very happy. Yeah, I'm Maria Arista Romero from Nanoscopy for Nanomedicine Group, and I'm going to talk about super resolution and videos like particles. So I'm very happy to speak after Roger because he already introduced very good things that I'm going to talk. So you will more or less already know a little bit. Uh, I don't even have to comment the importance of developing new vaccines. I think all of, he, all of us are here more than aware than ever that COVID-19 and vaccine development is crucial in our society. But even though COVID is, of course, our main hazard right now, we cannot forget about the other respiratory virus that we are starting to see this year, which is influenza. Only this year, only in the United States, up to 56 million people were sick of influenza and 62,000 people died because of this disease. And even though we have an influenza vaccine that uh, you can use every season, there is a still no universal vaccine that you can just have one shot and be immunized against influenza. Researchers are starting to look uh, to other types of vaccines, uh, like recombinant vaccines. And one of them are virus-like particles. As Ruje commented, a virus-like particle is basically the, co the cookie box, no? is a structure that mimic completely the shape and the size of the virus, but lack any genetic material, so they are completely safe. One thing about virus-like particles of influenza itself is that they are enveloped viruses and they don't have any capsids. So you only need the plasmids of the proteins of influenza, uh, transfect them in a cell, and they will be uh, expressed in the membrane because they have a transmembrane domain. By self-assembly, they will pack they will bud, they will produce a body, and they will be released. Even though there are more than 100 clinical trials regarding virus-like particles in general as vaccines, 14, for example, for COVID, uh, up, to, up to now, only five reached the market. And it's curious because some researchers uh, have, have thought that maybe it could be because the expression of the proteins uh, varies a lot, depends on the platform and depends on the type of plasma that you use. So it's a very uncontrollable uh, method. Uh, of course, the ideal would be to study the, vir the virus-like particle, but of course we have a limitation of resolution. Virus-like particles or influenza are around 100 nanometers diameter, so we have to break the diffraction limit, we have to break it, and to try to see the structures beyond the diffraction limit. Uh, I'm very happy because Rouget expressed his love of cryo-electron microscopy, that it could be one of the methods, as he's sh he shown, but uh, even though cryo-electron microscopy is super nice, you cannot label. Uh, very good, the samples with fluorescent, micro, uh, fluorescent dyes, for example. And in nanoscope and nanoscopy, the good thing is that you can use fluorescent uh, antibodies like a normal confocal immuno that you can do and you just can put in a special microscopy and you can do exactly the same. So you don't have to dry the sample or froze the sample to have it. Uh, in concrete, the super solution that I'm working on, I'm going to present you now, is called DNA paint, which is point accumulation of imaging, blah, blah, blah. It's a very long name. The important thing, this is what you see when you use a normal fluorescent microscopy. The fluorophores are all the time on, emitting fluorescence, and, and are, are always bound to the secondary antibody. In this uh, method, the antibody is not bound to the secondary antibody. It's bound to a sequence of DNA that is complementary to a sequence of DNA bound to the secondary antibody. They will bind and unbind in transient binding with a determined KD. And we will record a video. We will put the sample, focus. This will be bind and unbind, and we will record a video. And this is what we are going to see in the video. We're going to see this blinking. This is the dye binding and unbinding to the specific sequence of DNA in the antibody. Thanks to a Gaussian fitted and a post-process of the video, we will localize the center of each point, which is the center of emission, or the same, the antibody. So the software will put a dot in the exact center of each blinking or each uh, dye, 
and we can reconstruct a super resolution image seeing where exactly is each dye or each antibody in this case. The good thing about DNA paint, uh, basically we can do multicolor. In fact, we can do all the colors as we want because we only have to change the proof. We can have a resolution of nine, uh, of five uh, nanomolar. And especially what I'm going to talk here is the characterizing the spatial distribution and quantify. With this technique, what I did was characterize the expression of the three proteins of influenza in transfected cells. Uh, as you can see here, the three proteins of influenza uh, can be seen and you can see exactly where are the cluster of the three proteins in the same cell. If we do a zoom, we can see that the proteins, of course, are distributed in small clusters, in tetramers or trimers, depending on the protein, and we can merge and see exactly in which part of the membrane are what we believe are virus-like particles, which are these arrowheads, because it has the size of a virus-like particle and the three proteins are merged in the same area. Not only we can see the membrane, we can see the proteins, we can see the virus, but also we can quantify, which is very interesting, at single cell level. Normally, maybe when you do this type of assay, you just put all the cells together, do a Western blood, and see how much protein you have. In here, we can measure in each cell how much or how many proteins you have of the three proteins in the whole population of cells and in the same cell. As you can see here, for example, the three proteins are expressing completely different levels. Each point is each cell. Each cell express the protein in a different level. For example, Na is much more expressed than the other two, even though they are transfected at the same time, which is the funny thing, that you cannot much control the amount of expression that you have. Being very heterogeneous, I mean, sometimes even double or three times more. If we see each cell, and how much protein of the three proteins has each cell, we can see a very soft correlation when one protein is much more expressed, the other two are also highly expressed, but it's very soft correlation. In general, we see that uh, sometimes the cell express one protein a lot and the other two very low, and a mixture of them, indicating that indeed the process is very, very lack, uh, uh, controllable. Also, we wanted to see, of course, the virus-like particle. So for this, uh, basically, I took the supernatant of the cells, su uh, sucrose uh, gradient neutral centrifugation. I characterized them with TEM and with DLS, and I just labeled with a normal immune staining. Uh, we could see exactly how the proteins are distributed interparticle and intraparticle. What you see here is the virus-like particles of uh, 1,200 uh, population that I measured. Uh, we can see exactly where are HA and where, are, where is NA, how it's distributed along the particle, and how much protein we have, more or less. As you can see here, the expression of both proteins is very heterogeneous interparticle, having these small clusters, and none of them are very similar, meaning that I think we believe we have a very heterogeneous population of BLPs. We can also measure the amount of proteins that we have more or less, and as an average per BLP, that's something that maybe you can measure with other techniques. But the good thing about this is that we can have the measurement per particle. So we can have a particle measurement of both proteins. Each of these dots is the measurement of HA and NA in a single BLP. So we can see how the whole population of viral light particles distribute, how much proteins of both are in each BLP, and we can try to see a correlation. As you can see here, which is the red line, we don't have any correlation. The, the population is quite heterogeneous, and sometimes we have much more HA than NA, or sometimes we have a value of NA much bigger than the other, et cetera. We did this with the other, uh, we, uh, with another combination of, of two proteins, which is uh, M2 and again NA, having very similar results. Both proteins are very heterogeneously distributed, are in small clusters, and are very uh, heterogeneous interparticle and intraparticle. In this case, both proteins are more or less evenly presented, and we also could see a single particle level how much protein we have in each BLP. In this case, I believe we have a little bit more correlation, even though the test, which is the red line, is not with us. <laughs> uh, I, I, See, I think I see a small correlation where M2 is a little bit more expressed, HA is a little bit more expressed as well. But again, as it's a, a, an, 
a self-assembly method, you cannot control anything at all. And in this case, in this population of VLPs, I believe we have a very heterogeneous okay, population. And basically, the take-home message that I want to bring to you, basically, is that thanks to DNFA and the super resolution microscopy, we can monitor and see exactly how the VLP expression is being produced from the membrane. We can see where are the clusters of, of proteins, how many of the proteins are we producing in each cell, etc. And we can measure at single particle level where are the three proteins and how they are distributed. In my case, I have a heterogeneous distribution, but of course, taking into account that I'm using a PHW2000 plasmid with three separate plasmids and it costs seven cell line. The good thing about this is that we believe that you can take any population of BLPs or viruses, and with super resolution microscopy, you can have an image of them to see exactly how is the population and have the image of how the virus look like. Thank you so much for your attention. Uh, thank you. I want to thank, uh, of course, my PI, Lorenz Albertazzi, but especially the Dr. Silvia Pujals, my supervisor, because without her, it would be impossible to have this result. And please check our social media uh, of the group, and you will find more super solution tests. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much, Maria. Very nice talk. Okay, so I had uh, a question, maybe you said that, but what, what cell type did you use for the expression? Yeah, I use it cos 7 basically because I'm doing a normal transfection and I'm, I selected basically because it's a cell line that is very easy to express, transfected plasma. And do you see the same degree of uh, heterogeneity in different cell types? or, or I have... didn't test different cell types. Uh, basically, uh, because I, I didn't try, the main issue of DNA pain or this technique is that kind of a slow to record. Uh, of course, I believe, depends on the cell line, of course, we will have different expression of proteins because I believe that this is one of the key issues. Maybe even in insects that I know VLPs are being produced mostly in the insect cells, for example, we can have even, even much more protein expression. And how about with the real virus? I really want to try. I have a sample of, of real virus in the lab, which is inactivated, and I really want to try because I believe it's going to be also very different. I was able to perform this type of uh, super solution on, on cells infected with influenza, but seeing at the filaments, I don't know if you know that mm -hmm. influenza can produce filaments. And for example, depending on the protein that you're seeing, of course, in the filaments, there are different expressions, but this is more reliable to to the biological uh, uh, role of those proteins. So that this is the good thing about DNA pain that you can use to measure and to see where are the proteins in any type of structure. Okay, and I guess you really need large amounts of viruses and VLPs to... You will be surprised because I believe I don't produce a, a huge stock of it uh, because uh, with super resolution, the thing is that we need to see very small areas in the microscope. So while we have a few amount in the area, for us it's enough. We don't need a huge amount. Okay. I have one question as well for Maria. It is yeah. possible to modulate the, the expression uh, just using, I don't know what is the, the trick, but perhaps a different uh, vector, so you can yeah. have more expression of one on the other and this will end up with a different kind of virus or particle, right? I believe completely. In fact, the plasmid that I'm using is PHW2000, which I've been told that is a low expression plasmid. Uh, mm -hmm. Why I chose it? Because uh, the, the collaborators that gave me the plasmid could not give me a, a one single plasmid with the three proteins, which we, we, I think would be the ideal. And I, I wanted the same vector for the three proteins, so I chose this vector because I was the only vector that I had with three. But I believe that changing the vector putting the three proteins in the same vector, but so they are, will be produced at the same time. And maybe modulating the cell line and also playing maybe with the time points. I, I select for uh, 48 hours because at 70 hours, I didn't saw a lot of difference. But I believe that maybe modulating this, we could have a huge uh, expression. So you got to come next year and show us the results. Thank you so much. I, I, I so appreciate it because I love this talk. I came last year and I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Okay, so we move on. There are no 
further questions. And the next talk will be by Mireya Garcia Lopez. Uh, yep. Yeah. <laughs> and the title will be Serum and Intrahepatic HBV Markers and HBV Specific CD8 T cell Responses After Nucleus Seed of Type Analog Therapy Discontinuation in HB8. Uh, Antigen, I suppose, negative chronic hepatitis B patient. Well, thank you. <laughs> um, first of all, I would like to thank to the meeting organizers to give us the opportunity to share work about HBV specific immune response after stopping treatment for hepatitis B. So, as you all know, hepatitis B is a viral infection of the liver where patients are usually treated with NUCs. Uh, to achieve suppression of viral replication. However, functional cure occurs in less than 1% of the cases per year, and most patients have to be treated for life. This is because NUCs have little effect on CCC DNA in the liver. This limitation is important because CCC DNA is an essential intermediate for HBV replication and its elimination is one of the goals of new therapies against the hepatitis B virus to reach complete cure. Current clinical guidelines consider stopping therapy in HBE antigen negative uh, patients with a viral suppression for more than three years. When these patients stop treatment, usually after a virological relapse, there are three main possible outcomes. Uh, one, Patients that experience high levels of HPV replication and they need to be retreated. Two, patients that reach a virological control and remain as inactive carriers or in the gray zone. And three, patients that lose the surface antigen achieving the functional cure. However, the factors associated with a successful outcome are still under investigation. So for this reason, the aim of our study is to investigate the biological and immunological factors associated with a successful NUC therapy discontinuation in hepatitis B patients. For this study, we included 27 E negative patients treated with NUCs with a viral suppression for more than three years. Also, without advanced fibrosis, co infection, hepatocellular carcinoma, or immunosuppressive treatment. Once we stopped NUC therapy treatment, reintroduction criteria was defined according to the occurrence of high ALT and HBB DNA levels during follow-up as shown in this table. Before stopping therapy, we took a liver biopsy at baseline to discard advanced fibrosis and to determine CCC DNA, HBB DNA, and HBB RNA. Serum samples were collected during the follow-up for 24 months to quantify HBB DNA as antigen, correlated antigen, and HBB RNA. Moreover, to study the specific T cell responses against HBB, we isolated PBMCs before and after NUC discontinuation, and we performed an in vitro stimulation with overlapping peptides covering the core envelope and polymerase proteins. We use flow cytometry to analyze the cytotoxic response through the determination of CD107 and the production of pro-inflammatory cytokines such as interferon gamma and TNF. As for results, we can see here the baseline characteristic of the patients. The majority were men infected by genotype D and treated with tenofovir for a median of eight years. Regarding serum biological markers, close to 50% of the patients had detectable serum levels of correlate antigen and HBV RNA. Interestingly, for, as for liver biological markers, all patients had detectable intrahepatic HBV DNA and CCC DNA at baseline, and 65% of patients had detectable intrahepatic HBV RNA. We analyzed if there was a correlation between serum and liver markers, and we observed that S antigen levels significantly correlated with intrahepatic HBV DNA and intrahepatic HBV RNA, but not with CCC DNA. 
as expected, serum HBB RNA correlated with intrahepatic HBB RNA. In addition, serum HBB RNA correlated with HBB DNA. However, correlated antigen was not associated with any of them uh, of the liver markers analyzed. Regarding patient's outcome, at the end of the 24-month follow-up, approximately 30% uh, of the um, patients lost S antigen, achieving functional cure, 50% remained as biological controllers, and 20% needed knockout reintroduction. Analyzing baseline biological markers in serum, we found that S antigen levels were lower in patients who lost the S antigen compared to the other outcomes. Also, most of the patients that achieved S antigen, um, uh, pardon, no, ah, vale, sorry. Uh, also, most of the patients that achieved S antigen uh, lose had undetectable levels of uh, correlate antigen and HBV RNA. But this trend was not significant, probably due to the small sample size. When we analyzed baseline biological markers in tissue, we observed that HBV DNA levels were lower in patients who lost S antigen. However, CCC DNA levels were not different uh, regardless of clinical outcomes. Also, most of the patients that achieved functional cure had undetectable HBV RNA in the liver. This suggests that transcriptional activity of CCC DNA was lower in patients who end up losing their antigen. To evaluate the impact of baseline's, uh, baseline T cell response on the clinical outcome after NUC discontinuation, we investigated the vector capacity of HPV specific CDA T cells. We observed an increased proportion of patients that remaining of therapy had functional CD80 cell responses to one or more HBB proteins compared to retreated patients. These differences were more evident for CD107 and interferon gamma, but not with, uh, for TNF. Indeed, when we checked baseline cytotoxic frequencies, we observed that the percentage of CD107 positive cells was higher in patients that remained of therapy in compar uh, comparison with patients that needed nuclear introduction. This difference remained at week 12 post withdrawal. On the other hand, we did not observe any difference regarding the expression of pro-inflammatory cytokines such as interferon gamma and TNF between the different outcomes at any of the time points uh, analyzed. But when we investigate the presence of polyfunctional CD80 cells, we observed that the percentage of core specific T cells co-producing interferon gamma and TNF at baseline was increased among patients who remained of therapy compared to those patients needing treatment reintroduction. Importantly, this increase persisted during the first year or year of follow-up. So to conclude, uh, NUX uh, treatment inter interruption is feasible in a large proportion of chronic HBE antigen negative patients. Indeed, around 30% of the patients achieved uh, functional cure. These patients have a decreased CCC DNA transcription and low S antigen levels at baseline, and the presence of functional HBV specific CDA T cells at baseline was associated with sustained uh, viral control, and these responses persist after uh, treatment withdrawal. So finally, I would like to thank to, uh, my group or collaborators, funding institutions, hospital clinic staff or patients, and to you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Mireya. So now we have time for a few questions. Let's see, I will go with the first. Uh, mm -hmm. You said the, the, the size of the, of the group is 27 patients. Yep. Uh, this is a, 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 they, they were chosen or, or this was the, the, the patients that you have available? In, in other words, it is mm -hmm. possible to expand the study for a larger cohort? 
that have uh, more information at the end? Mm. Uh, well, these patients were the patients that, uh, with these characteristics that we were uh -huh. uh, looking for. I mean, three years with uh, suppression of the virus and treated for more than um, three years with NOx. Um, but um, as you can see in the slide of methodology, uh, we took a biopsy. Mm -hmm. uh, some patients don't want to be yeah, by yeah. so uh, that was the unique limitation more or less that we found <laughs> because the the regular therapy it does is not invasive so you, you exactly uh, i mean uh, it's a pill that you must to take every day and well some of the patients that achieve a uh, functional cure are really happy because they forget about the pill and now mm -hmm. they can live mm -hmm. without mm -hmm. the virus but the biopsy is well yeah okay that, that explains perfectly all right uh yeah we have one question from andreas Hans. did you take also the level of exhausted t cells in your patient group no we didn't uh, check it uh we have um well we have pbmcs to check another panel or some well, another markers for these kind of cells, but we just uh, see. Well, we checked also EL2, but the staining was not very well. Uh, MIP one beta, um, but no, no, nothing about exhausted T cells. Okay. I don't see more questions. So if, uh, thank you again, uh, Mireya, for your talk. Thank you to you. And uh, it's the time for the last uh, talk in this session. It's going to be a flash talk by Esther Garcia Pras. It will be three minutes, and then we have a couple of minutes for questions. And the title is HD antigen abundance in hepatitis delta patients before liver transplantation is associated with hepatitis delta virus infection of the graft. Okay, good afternoon to everyone. Thank you for the presentation. My name is Esther Garcia Pras, and I'm going to present you the, our last results in the group. Uh, hepatitis uh, delta virus is a chronic inflammatory liver disease uh, caused by uh, delta hepatitis, which is a small defective virus uh, which requires the hepatitis, hepatitis V virus uh, to propagate. In fact, uh, delta virus uh, needs uh, his envelope or its envelope protein, the surface antigen from V virus, to ensure its uh, assembly and infectivity. Uh, uh, hepatitis delta virus um, is the, the most severe form of uh, viral hepatitis, being the liver transplantation the only therapeutic option for patients who develop cellular carcinoma or the compensated cirrhosis. So, the aim of our study was to characterize the expression and distribution of uh, these viral antigens by immunodetection in liver biopsies from co-infected patients who undergo liver transplantation. Uh, here I show you two confocal images in which you can see in red uh, the delta antigen and in green uh, the surface antigen from the virus uh, uh, with his distribution in, in the cytoplasm. So what we observed was that delta antigen was detected in 76% of liver biopsies before liver transplantation with this predominantly nuclear staining. Surface antigen was also observed in almost all liver biopsies with the delta st antigen staining. But what it was really surprising for us and not expected was to find that the co-expression of both antigens in the same hepatocyte was a real rare event. Here you can see this uh, co-expression. 
regarding the infection of the new graft, uh, here you have the two images, two confocal images of uh, liver before uh, being transplanted and then take the 10 days post liver transplantation. And what we observed was that that delta antigen was present in 27% of this post liver transplantation biopsies in several time points. Surface antigen was not detected in any of these uh, post liver transplantation biopsies. And we have to point out that patients with detectable uh, antigen delta in these biopsies had showed a high proportion of delta infected hepatocytes in their corresponding explant sample. So we may conclude that uh, delta infection of the liver graft is a frequent event and may remain as a long latent infection. And we uh, could hypothesize that uh, surface antigen, low surface antigen expression levels in liver explants would suggest that minimal amounts of this envelope protein are required for delta virion assembly and further graft infection. But uh, studies uh, with more patients and with more sensitive techniques uh, would be very useful to solve that question. Uh, thank you for your attention and thanks uh, uh, to the whole group of viral toxic and metabolic uh, hepatopathies uh, of EDAPS. Time for questions now. And welcome everybody to this um, last lecture. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce you to Dr. James Pipas. He's a molecular biology professor at the Department of Biological Science at the University of Pittsburgh in Pennsylvania. His research is focused on uh, determining how viruses, in particular poliomaviruses, contribute to infection and pathology, as well as to explore viral diversity by surveilling, surveilling uh, viruses in nature through the application of metagenomics and uh, computational tools. Those who have, the, have had the chance of meeting him sometime probably have heard from him to declare that the most amazing protein in the world is poliomavirus, the antigen. And I think that this perfectly reflects the enthusiasm that Jim puts into, into his research. Uh, so this afternoon, James Pipas is going to delight us with his talk, which will be our closing lecture and is entitled Enabling Ecosystem Scale Viral Metagenomics. Uh, so welcome, Jim. Thank you very much to be here. And we hope to see you in person in Barcelona very soon. So you can proceed to share your presentation with the audience uh, whenever you want. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Silva. Thank you, Silva. And um, uh, greetings to all of you from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in the USA. Um, I've been sitting in on the talks and the, uh, the diversity and the quality of the science you're, you guys are doing is very impressive. I've, I've really enjoyed it. So thank you for making me part of it. Um, as Silva said, uh, a lot of our research is focused on the details of the uh, battle between virus and host cell. Uh, and these studies are hypothesis driven and and we get into the details of the molecular biology. Uh, but I'm not gonna talk about any of that today. I'm gonna talk about the other part of my scientific life where I just like to explore the biosphere. Uh, I, I, I like to turn over rocks and look under logs and just see what's there. And the, and the tool I'm using is metagenomics. Uh, so I kinda wanna share an, an a, uh, outrageous dream with you, an impossible dream and then tell you a couple of stories about how we're trying to, trying to achieve it. Uh, so the, the dream really is to achieve ecosystem scale metagenomics. And you know, metagenomics involves identifying tax of organisms uh, from uh, next generation sequencing data. And one of the keys to this approach is what kind of samples do you collect? Uh, so we've looked at untreated wastewater, um, and we've looked at animal feces and human specimens, and we've got a really fascinating project going on with ecologists looking at the pollen virome. Uh, but really, if I want to think about this broadly, uh, what's the ultimate goal? What's the real big dream? 
and what are the barriers to achieving it? And, and so here's my outlandish dream and we can have some fun look talking about it. Uh, in terms of viral su surveillance, what we'd really like to know is if we look at a specific ecosystem, we'd like to have a catalog of every virus that exists in that ecosystem. But more so, we'd like to attract, be able to track the real-time movement of viruses, uh, both in geographic space, in time, and across different species. And we'd like to be able to do this simultaneously. We'd like to sort of create a weather map of planet Earth showing the movement of viruses across space and, and, and among different species. So that's pretty outrageous. And, uh, but I still like to think about these things and try to, and try to approach them. So one issue you have when you're doing this kind of study is what kind of sample do you wanna take? And I wanna focus on just one sample today, really just tell you a story about increasing the efficiency of sample procurement and increasing the efficiency of the computational steps of metagenomics that maybe can make us approach this ecosystem scale surveillance. All right, so the, um, so the sample I wanna talk about today is blood. Um, many viruses cause viremia in their infected hosts. And so uh, if you collect blood from all vertebrates in an ecosystem, uh, some subset of them are going to have viruses associated with that blood. And by sequencing the blood, you can deduce the um, species of the, of the, from which the blood was obtained and then detect any viruses present. Right. Um, so we thought about this. We thought, well, if we wanted to collect blood from all vertebrates in an ecosystem, how would we do it? And I guess you could send thousands of graduate students out armed with hypodermic needles. Uh, but that is low throughput. And so uh, what I'm gonna tell you the story about is a project I've been doing with Microsoft the uh, last four years, Project Premonition. And the idea is to rejuvenate an old idea, the flying hypodermic needle hypothesis, and that is to use mosquitoes as a device. So there's over 3000 species known to, uh, uh, known species of mosquitoes and as a collection, they, they, they obtain blood, uh, the females of those species obtain blood from all vertebrates. Uh, some are specialists, they like just humans or they like just amphibians and others are generalists. Uh, but as a group, they do exactly what they want, what, what we want to have done. They go out and collect blood. So the strategy is in Project Premonition is to capture mosquitoes at scale in a given ecosystem and then sequence individual mosquitoes. So if we sequence an individual mosquito, we should be able to computationally determine the species of that mosquito. Uh, if it's blooded, we should be able to determine the species of the host from which it uh, obtained that blood. And then if we look deeper into the sequences, we should be able to identify parasites and bacteria and viruses present. And the, the whole idea is you say, okay, this, into, this particular mosquito uh, bit a zebra. It contains zebra blood. We find vir virus X in it. Uh, maybe zebras have virus X. And from that, we can start building a catalog of viruses in the environment. So, uh, the two stories I'm going to tell you about is how do we catch the mosquitoes at scale and how, how do we just handle all of the sequence data we would get if, this, if we really did this. Okay, so catching mosquitoes first. Um, so uh, when Microsoft and us teamed on this, we looked at mosquito traps and here's a tr uh, one type of traditional mosquito trap. It has a, oops, excuse me. It has a CO2 source here. Uh, the CO2 sublimes down into a fan here that's driven by a car battery. Uh, and the CO2 attracts mosquitoes into this netting. Okay, this is low throughput. You have to hang the trap uh, and then retrieve it some hours later or a day later. And then when you do retrieve it, you have um, no idea when individual insects were captured 
during this period. Some of them were captured, may have been captured right after you set the trap. Others may have been captured much later. Uh, and furthermore, uh, not just mosquitoes go into the trap, all sorts of bugs go in there. And so you an entomologist has to dump this mix out onto a plate and, a, and manually identify the mosquitoes from the mix. So this is not gonna work. So the first thing we had to do to achieve this project was design a better mosquito trap. And we've been working on, it's really been a pleasure to work with the Microsoft engineers and computer scientists, scientists to do this. And so here's an example of the approach we're taking. Uh, Microsoft has constructed a state-of-the-art mosquito containment lab on the Redmond campus, shown here. Uh, and we can program this laboratory uh, for any photo period on planet Earth and any climate on planet Earth. Um, and then we use this lab to study mosquito behavior uh, so we can teach the traps via artificial intelligence how to distinguish a mosquito from some other insects. The whole idea is to design a trap that is going to attract a mosquito and capture it, but it's going to ignore all the other in insects in the environment. So, uh, so here's an example of the type of experiment we can do in the lab. So here we're just testing uh, carbon dioxide as, a, as an attractant, and we're just measuring different things like is it better to do a continuous flow flow or a continuous high flow or pulses. And the test subjects are uh, these mosquitoes flying around. And they're being monitored by high-speed cameras that track the movement of each individual mosquito in real time. And so we can feed this data into a computer, and these lines show the individual flight paths, or the fight flight paths of individual mosquitoes. Over here on the right is the, is the attractant, the CO2 being emitted by the device. And you can see a heavy concentration of flight, uh, of mosquito flights uh, around, the, uh, around the attractant. And so we can quantify this using the computer and then teach the trap um, how to pulse out the, the CO2, okay? So we've done this with a number of parameters over the last four years, and, and we are now on version three of the trap, and this is what it looks like. Um, we've actually moved beyond version three, but this is the field deployable one. And the new version of the mosquito trap is a smart trap. It's a robotic field biologist. So it consists of this casing here, which is ultra light, and ultimately we'd like to make this drone deliverable. We're not there yet, so we're just focusing on capturing the mosquitoes. Uh, but the trap consists of 128 doors right here, and uh, you set them out um, with these doors open. On top of the trap is a CO2 source and a microprocessor, a very powerful small computer. Um, so if you look right here, what you'll see is uh, a door open and pretty soon a mosquito is going to fly by. Look, there it goes. Boom. And the door snaps shut. All right. So what's happened is there's a photocell here emitting some light. And when, the mos when an insect crosses the plane of the door, uh, the computer instantly measures the frequency of the wing beat and a number of other physiological parameters. And then the computer makes an instant decision. Uh, uh, mosquito? Not mosquito. If it's not a mosquito, the door stays open. If it is a mosquito, the door snaps shut. Now we have an individually captured mosquito. And when that door snaps shut, the microprocessor measures an amazing amount of data. GPS position of the capture, time of capture, humidity, barometric pressure, temperature, ambient sound, uh, just a number of, uh, a lot of metadata so that we know when each mosquito is captured and a lot of data surrounding the, um, the uh, uh, conditions under which it was captured. Um, so we can put this um, mosquito into the environment or, or this trap into the environment. And here's an example of the trap we've put in Tanzania through a collaboration Microsoft has with the Jane Goodall Foundation um, just to test its ability to distinguish mosquitoes from other insects in a real, uh, in a real environment. And it's about 99.8% efficient at that. Um, so that's story one. I think we've developed a new way. I think this will actually change field biology, a lot of insect biology uh, because of the metadata you can capture. And I think we've, we've shown now, convinced ourselves we can capture mosquitoes at scale. Um, now, 
I want to move to the next problem, which is how do you handle? So, so what if you capture thousands of mosquitoes? How do you um, computationally analyze that much data? Um, and so uh, what I've been focused on with Microsoft for the last uh, three years is developing a computational pipeline to do this. Um, traditional uh, pipelines looking for microbes or for uh, viruses usually uh, try to subtract out the host sequences, but uh, that eliminates a lot of information. So what we do is leverage the power of cloud computing to look at all the sequences. So uh, in our approach, when we sequence a mosquito, each individual sequence read is compared to all known sequences in the tree of life. That's about 650,000 reference genomes at present. Uh, and we have enough computer power to, to, to do this. Uh, so we align every um, read against uh, all known sequences. And then we use a, a probabilistic mixture model uh, to place each read into a specific taxa. And uh, as I'll show you in a minute, the, 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 this, uh, this assignment can get down to the species level very efficiently and rapidly. Uh, so then the last part of this is how do you, uh, oh, and then we um, assemble all the sequences. We don't just do alignment. We assemble all the sequences and we look at genome structure and the, and, and the genes present. And it's a combination of the alignment and the genome structure that makes us convinced that a certain taxa is present. All right, then we visualize the data through these, uh, uh, we've done a lot of uh, debugging with synthetic experiments, but we visualize the data in these chronoplots. And I don't know if you've ever worked with one of these, this movie plays pretty fast, but the different rings are different taxa, reads of different taxa. In this one, we've selected viral reads and uh, there is a known mosquito virus self-using agent in this. And the program takes you right to a coverage map of that virus uh, or right down to the sequence level so you can look at variations between the virus you've discovered and uh, reference sequences. Uh, so you create each, uh, one chrono plot like this for each sample and uh, the rate limiting step is how, that we're still working on now is how do you merge a lot of these together uh, to have the computer analyze them. All right, so uh, we in our project we haven't started sequencing uh, massive amounts of mosquitoes yet, uh, but we did want to test this software. Uh, and so we teamed up with the Burroughs Welcome Foundation, who were generous enough to provide us with their data from the Anopheles Gamby 1000 Genome Project. And so Burroughs, uh, Anopheles Gamby is a species mosquito that is a malaria vector. And uh, the Burroughs Welcome Foundation has a program to look at mosquito, their, the genetics of this mosquito. And part of this, their goal was to sequence 1,000 individual Anopheles mosquitoes. And they're, they're actually up to about 2,000 now. Uh, but they provided us with the data so we could just take the DNA sequencing data and um, see if our program worked. Um, the uh, Limiting factors are that this is DNA sequencing, so we're not going to see any RNA viruses. Um, and as in with, with all metagenomic studies, all biology, sample degradation and physical contamination are your enemies. So we did not control the collection of samples. These were pulled out of freezers at different places in Africa. Uh, and we didn't control the subsequent steps uh, to sequencing. And so we had to computationally eliminate a lot of contamination. But let's see what we found in this, uh, this data set. All right, so we examined one, uh, a little over 147 billion sequence reads. And as you would expect, almost all of them were, were mosquito. And in fact, uh, uh, our classifier said they were a single species of mosquito, Anopheles gambi. Uh, so that was a, a good control. Then we also saw some chordata sequences and uh, about 3%. And these represent blood meals that a subset of the mosquitoes have obtained. And I'll show you what those are in a second. And then we also identified bacteria and viruses in this, in this data set. Uh, just uh, out of, uh, on a side, 59 out of the 1142 samples, uh, we detected plasmodium, the, uh, 
malaria parasite. Okay, so if you look at the, the chordate reads, uh, 162 of the 1142 samples, we could detect um, some kind of uh, chordate, uh, and most of them were human. And that's to be expected because Anopheles gambi is, is homophilic mosquito species. It loves humans. Uh, it will occasionally bite animals that are near humans. It's opportunistic. Uh, but this frequency is about what we'd expect. So we detected humans in some of the mosquitoes, human sequences, uh, bovine sequences, dog, horse, and, and one bird. All right, then if you look at the bacteria we detected, uh, there was a, uh, this plot shows the number of bacterial reads over here in the Y axis and samples going across the X. So you see there's an enormous, this is a log scale. So you see enormous variation in the number of bacterial reads with some samples having as many bacterial reads as they do mosquito reads, which is indicated up here at the top. Um, so we think these samples um, have deteriorated and there's a bacteria happily growing on the mosquito corpse. Um, if we analyze uh, both the protein space and the alignment space, we conclude that 478 out of the 1142 uh, samples had bacteria associated with them. And that's sort of informative because uh, uh, it tells you the majority of the mosquitoes had no bacteria. We couldn't even detect bacteria in them. Um, and maybe they don't, they don't have a microbiome. Um, our, our program also worked to the species level. So here's two species of, of bacteria that are associated with um, the microbiome of Anopheles, uh, Sorthelia anopheles and uh, Elizabeth Keeley anopheles. And these blue dots represent coverage. So you see some of the samples had almost complete coverage of that bacterial genome. And the orange bars represent the percent of bacterial reads that were Sorthelia. And you should, so you see some samples like these were almost, they only had a single bacteria, it was Sorthelia, and others, Sorthelia was just one component of the bacteria that were, that were present. Now, if we sift down through this to, um, to viruses, uh, then we detected viral sequences in 223 of the 1142 samples, and most of these were contamination. And we had to eliminate those manually and we're working on software to, that can learn how to do this, but we're not there yet. Uh, however, 19 out of the 1142 samples contain authenticated uh, eukaryotic viral sequences. So these are not arboviruses. These are viruses that don't grow in mosquitoes, but grow in other eukaryotes. So what were these 19? Uh, and the results really got me excited. I think the, the whole method is, will work in theory. So 15 of the 1142 samples contained hepatitis B virus. And you know, this virus goes vi uh, will uh, go to a high viremia in, in humans. And all of these 15 samples contained, were blooded by humans. So they contained human sequences. So we think, uh, uh, oh, and then we examined the substrain of HBV that we was isolated. And it's a substrain E that's only found uh, is circulating in Africa where the mosquitoes were collected. It's not the Western strain or the British strain. So, so we actually think that, the, that these mosquitoes are uh, detecting humans infected with hepatitis B virus. And you can see here from this map that we achieve complete coverage of the hepatitis B genome sometimes. So this circle on the outside is the genome. Uh, this light gray is the, are the coding blocks of hepatitis B and the pink is coverage. And in this sample, we got almost complete coverage. Uh, now the other samples were parvoviruses. One was a ungulate erythroparvovirus. That's a, a, a blood virus of cows and this mosquito was blooded with uh, bovine sequences. And then we contained, uh, we identified a human parvovirus present in three samples also blooded with humans. And again, we could get pretty much complete coverage. So those are my two stories. And, and what I hope I've at least got you a little bit excited about or curious about is that we, could, we might be able to put it together a strategy um, that at least 
greatly increase the efficiency of metagenomic studies of the environment. And so we've done this by taking lab studies where we can um, optimize trap design uh, and then to use that to design smart tracks, traps that robotically collect and classify mosquitoes at, at large scale. And then use deep sequencing to identify the arthropod species, the blood meal, and any, any uh, viruses or bacteria present. Um, and really this is all made possible by, by advances in three areas that, that even, if, even if this idea is crazy, I hope you'll be thinking about because the action in science is often at the interface of fields. And so I just, by closing, want to say uh, that what's got me excited about biology is amazing advances in the fields of computation and artificial intelligence that greatly increase our ability to collect samples and analyze data. And you couple that with gene sequencing, maybe we can take some steps toward my dream of uh, achieving eco scale, uh, ecosystem scale metagenomics. So thank you. I was thanking Jim for this nice presentation and I'm going to uh, read one of the questions we have in the chat from Nuria Busquets. He thanks for the presentation and she has a couple of technical questions. First one is, if do you sequence only full blood engorget females for virome analysis? And how do you attract the mosquitoes to enter to the intelligent trap? <laughs> so two excellent questions. Um, so in the studies we showed uh, there from the AG1000 data, uh, those were just mosquitoes. And so we could only detect uh, about a tenth of them being blooded uh, in that experiment. In the trap design, uh, we just catch random mosquitoes. And actually we expect blooded mosquitoes to be very rare uh, because usually when a mosquito obtains this blood meal, it flies over to a wall and sits there for digestion. And so it, it's not interested in going into a trap. Um, so what we found is about in, by putting these traps in the wild is just randomly, we capture about a, about a 10th of the mos, uh, mosquitoes, about 10% turn out to be blooded. Um, those are the ones we would focus on sequencing. Okay. And which percentage of virome you detect correspond to insect specific virus? So in the, so we've done several different sequencing experiments. Uh, in small scale experiments where we sequence mosquitoes from Grenada and Houston and the Keys, we could detect a number of different types of mosquito viruses. This was RNA and DNA sequencing. And almost all of the mosquito viruses we detected were RNA viruses. There were a couple of densoviruses, but which are DNA parvoviruses, but, but most of them were RNA viruses. Um, so we couldn't see those in the AG1000 data set we analyzed because they just did DNA sequencing, right? So we're just getting ready to, to deploy 600 traps in Harris County, Texas. That's where Houston is. And this will be our first big scale sequencing effort. And so if I talk to you again, I'll be able to tell you how that came out. Okay, also Dr. Juan Jose Lopez Moya wants to uh, uh, congratulate you for your presentation and ask you if did you detect plant viruses when analyzing your NGS data? Right, so if we look again, if we look at the, uh, uh, so the short answer is yes, we can detect plant viruses in mosquitoes. Uh, that they were not present in the AG1000 data set, but in our sequencing of other environmental samples, we can see them. Now, mosquitoes are pollinators, uh, so you might expect some of them to, to carry plant um, material and plant viruses. Okay, I have, a, a, I think there are no more questions. I have one last question. And to have you here, and I would like to, to ask you, which is, uh, since you have been Ah, you're freezing up. Family sequences. All right, you're freezing, uh, Silva. You're your gonna opinion have to... on, on what do you think about 
seeing new emerging coronaviruses strain. Okay, I heard the emerging coronaviruses part. Sorry. So you'll have to, but I didn't hear the first part of the question. Ah, uh, okay. I, I was, uh, guess, uh, I guess, seeing coronaviruses uh, sequences in this metagenomic. Ah, okay. So we haven't seen them yet, but um, so here's the, here's the question. So if you look at, for example, COVID-19, there's no evidence that really achieves high viremia. Uh, so we wouldn't expect to see it in our blood collection experiments from mosquitoes, but that's in humans. So one thing I'm interested in is we don't know if it achieves, uh, if viruses like that achieve viremia in their natural host. In fact, we don't even know what the natural host is for sure, right? And so um, if it does achieve viremia in the natural, natural, natural host, then this methodology ought to be able to pick it up. Um, but you know, you have to think of beyond blood too. I mean, I, I told a story about blood today and mosquitoes, but these same type of approaches apply to other types of samples, including wastewater or, or, um, or one of my favorites, animal feces, because you can, again, associate the sample with an individual uh, species of organism. Um, so I think if you, the ultimate goal would be to combine all these approaches. Okay, thank you very much, Jim. Hey, thank you all. Hope to see you soon. <laughs> I hope to be there soon. <clears throat> okay, so then, then it is on me. So uh, thank you very much, Jim. I, I enjoyed very much your talk. I love the idea of of a weather forecast for for viruses moving around the world. Very wild idea. Keep them and and continue your excellent work. Very, very interesting. And now it's up to me. Is like basically. I want to have a few words before I hand over to Nuria to finish the meeting. And also, I'm very impressed on the broad uh, number of, on, on the excellent talks. Great science was there, what we saw, very, very diverse. You know, we had the clinical aspects from viruses, from, of course, much about corona, of the times on hepatitis, on transplantation issues, plant viruses always, because they are very strong here. In, in, in our uh, society. Then uh, we went from uh, very basic research, translation landscapes, you know, to more, uh, to this, what you last uh, made about this weather idea of weather cars of virome, how this would move in the world. Very exciting what you can find out. And then to structural analysis. And structural analysis, we had great talks about two technologies this was the cryo EM and the uh, super resolution or this uh, DNA paint microscopy. And now I come, this is my, 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 my words to come over to the prices. So my, my role is now to give two prices. The first price will be 300 euro uh, and the second price will be of 200 euro for the, for the most interesting or best speech. It should not just cover excellent science, but should be presented in an accessible way and, and for a broad audience. And uh, the first boat was very clear and the second boat was not so clear because it was pretty much diverse. So many people liked a lot of talks. I think this is a very good sign even for the quality of the meeting. But then um, we still have two, uh, two persons, but the first one and the winner is, and I like to, to congratulate you, Roger Castells Grails from the Department of Biological Chemistry in, in Norwich. He got the first prize for his excellent and uh, presentation on virus in motion, or how he understands maturation of a virus on by by cryo EM. So congratulations, excellent presentation. Uh, I suppose you are, you were a postdoc. Yeah, I'm not postdoc. Thank you, thank you so much. Oh, great. There you are. Perfect. Yes, you got the one, first prize, 300 euro. It's yours. Enjoy it. Well, and thank you. The, prize, the second prize, I mean, the prize is not from me. It's, it's of course, it's the voting of the, or the committee of this, of, this, uh, of this meeting organizers. Now, the second prize also goes to somebody who works on structure. And this was Maria Arista Romero, 
uh, for her uh, from here from Barcelona on her talk on uh, uh, on, on super resolution microscopy. And thank you, if... thank you so much. Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> I changed the the position, but I'm here. Okay, congratulations to you also thank you uh, so for much. the second prize. Uh, I hope. Uh, I don't know how it will work. So if you don't get a notice from, I will send this again to Nuria in, a, in an email and then she is going to contact you or, or if you don't hear from us very early then, then please uh, write uh, back to Nuria who was organizing uh, everything, okay? And Perfect. then congratulations for your votes. So I congratulate all of you because the, the session today was amazing. I really enjoyed the whole day. Yeah, it was very intense and and interesting, so, so the virologists, they like a lot what you did on structure, very evidently. So, and now I would like to finish my little uh, summary of this, and I would like to hand over to Nuria, uh, who organized it. I want, first of all, to congratulate her for this excellent uh, getting together of people, of this broad uh, variety of, of, of disciplines, and, and to, to manage it so, so nicely. So, Nuria, very well done, and then please, you have the last word here uh, for, for, for this Catalan Virology Society. Take care. Bye. Th thanks a lot, Andreas. Mm, well, esperem que, que hagueu gaudit molt d'aquesta jornada. Ha sigut tan, tan interessant i informativa. Penso que realment ha sigut un èxit en tots els sentits. I us agraïm a tots la vostra participació. I ens veiem a la propera. No tinc tan clar si serà via telemàtica o no, però el més important és que continuem fent aquesta recerca d'elevada qualitat científica i que puguem compartir amb la societat els nostres resultats. A dia d'avui estan pendents, molt pendents de nosaltres. Així que seguim. We hope you have enjoyed this exciting and informative meeting. It has been a, a successful meeting, as Andrea said. Thank you for all for your participation and see you next time. I'm not sure it will be again online, but the most important thing is that we continue doing this high quality research. We can share with the society our results. This society is now looking at us carefully and we have to continue. Thank you, thank you very much.